one more thing here, and then I'll just take whatever questions. This has to do with this thing about this being part of the, the loop, that you're part of the loop. This is for George Knapp with regards to Skinwalker Ranch. He said those who were the most aggressive had the worst experiences. And he said it feeds off of fear, this uh, thing. So the question is, who's providing the fear? Uh, we, there's a guy out of California who's an experiencer who talked talk about the fact that the beings that he had talked to stated that when they encounter a human being, they actually scan your brain. And what they do is they will use what's in your brain to teach you a lesson. So if, if it's fear, it's in your brain, they'll use fear to teach you a lesson. If it's, and that's where this thing comes, this angelic thing, if you're into oming and angelic stuff, then they'll use that to teach you a lesson. That's whatever's in your brain. And I was asked a question about PTSD. There's two types of uh, things that I think link in um, to this, this whole thing about what the mind can actually create. These are research, one is done at Stanford University, it's on lucid dreaming, I don't know if people know lucid dreaming. This is the dream where you realize you're awake in a dream and you can basically change the characters in the dream, you can basically change everything. Um, the, the, the research that was done started in 1975, they actually are to the ability now where they can put somebody, wire them up to, to the brain stuff put them down and when the person's in the dream they can actually send a signal. And the way they send a signal is your eyes can move in a lucid dream so what you do in your lucid dream to give a signal is you look left, right, left, right, left, right three times and on this signal it shows the left, right, left, right. The person's saying I'm in the dream, I'm awake and they can do Morse code, send stuff back. And in that thing, um, the way they describe it is uh, they've warned the people that when you're in there, when you run into, whether it's a devil, an evil alien, or whatever, they, the way they train is that what you do is you treat it with unconditional love, and you go towards it, you do not back away, you go towards it, give it a big hug and a kiss, and it will turn into a positive being and give you a positive message. And this is this plasticity of the mind, that once you get out of this conscious mind into this field, it becomes very sort of plastic. You can change the characters. The other one where I was mentioning something during the break, is research is done at John Hopkins University on psilocybin. This research has been going on for 20 years. This is high-dose psilocybin that they use for uh, people who are dying. If you've got less than six months to live, you can go there and this will resolve everything. You, they put you in this thing. They use it for cocaine addiction, heroin addiction, uh, alcohol, cigarettes, uh, PTSD, depression, very high success on depression. And what they do is they put you into this, again, a very plastic field sort of like a psychedelic thing, very high dose, and they have two people in the room, they train you for eight hours. You're not allowed to take this until you've been trained for eight hours. And what they're doing is they're telling you that 30% of all people will go down the rabbit hole and it'll start to turn ugly. And they have two people in the room and you always have two people so that if somebody has to go to the bathroom, there's somebody there, that when you start to see whatever it is, whatever scary thing you see in your, in your uh, uh, thing where you're describing going through this, uh, field, they grab you by the hand and they say, do not walk away. Go towards it. Confront it. It is there to help you. Go towards it. Do not be afraid. And they, can, they get this person to walk into it. And that's how they resolve all these shadow issues. So this is the thing is when you were, in, whether it's a high dose psilocybin thing where you get a lot of similarities with UFO type stuff where you get the same sort of uh, impressions or whether it's the uh, lucid dreaming, it's this very direct plasticity of the brain. That our brain, we think it's very solid, we think it's time and space exists. When you get into quantum physics, time and space sort of disappears. Uh, the whole idea about the, the world being solid, flat, all these things start to dissolve. And we realize, it's almost like they say, the tunnel of reality. That when you get to the other end, you suddenly realize everything you believe is wrong when you get to the other side. and So we're making a lot of assumptions about how the world works. So I just want to leave it at that, and uh, I'll take questions on whatever it is you want to talk about, whether it's the government or uh, conscious. I, I, I just make one point. We were actually showing some, some about court stuff, which is more bizarre than the stuff I was showing. It was like this one woman who's got this stuff going on, and it's the same thing. It's this bizarre, bizarre things where you're going like, how did this thing happen? There's a pile of sand appears under a chair in a restaurant.
that was appearing at home and then suddenly uh, sitting at the restaurant and looking at the same Paolo Sanchez under the, it's that kind of weird stuff where it makes you go like, what is going on? And it makes you think, and it, like the crop circle, it drags you into it, and it, it, it's giving you the signs, it's little breadcrumbs, follow the breadcrumb, follow the breadcrumb, and they, they make you go down the little brick road and they lead you to the other end, that's what they're doing. So where, where is this uh, experimentation taking place on the psilocybin? At uh, John Hopkins University. And um, can anybody volunteer for this? <laughs> it, it, it's a little, well, it's a little hard to get into the studies. They said a lot of people were, were saying they had less than six months of life to try to get into experiences. Because it's very controlled. Okay. It's like they're using pure psilocybin, it's injected. Uh, this is a peer review. This is the uh, Griffith, Roland, Roland Griffith. If you go on YouTube and look up Roland Griffith, yeah. he gives a lot of lectures. And there's a woman by the name of Mary uh, Kuzman. Uh, Mary. Is the woman that hers is good because she talks about she's the woman that sits in the room. They've been doing this for 20 years for right. these people, so the, the thing takes about six hours. Yeah. And so they have these different programs. So they'll do like now they're doing meditation. So they want to take right. people who are 20 year meditators, yeah. put them onto this psilocybin thing, and, and then get them to meditate. To what happens? And they have these, so they have a lot of these programs going on. So it's hard to sort of get in these programs unless right. you, you have a. A certain thing, like so, so it like it, it sounds similar to what they used to do with LSD, yeah, it's many, many sure. years ago. Psycho yeah. Psychologists and psychiatrists yeah. were yeah. using that, yeah. In fact, the guy who did AA, yeah, who was a trans channeler, oh, yeah, uh, wanted to use LSD because they had 59% instantaneous uh, alcoholics breaking the habit, yeah, instantaneously, that, yeah. and they would they were not going there. They, 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 Bill we're not bringing this into AA. Yeah. No yeah. Bill Williams was Bill, involved in that? Oh yeah, Bill Williams was big. And plus he was also a, a, a trans channeler. He was like Edgar Casey. Uh, he was he had a, a if you look at the it's actually on the AA site, they, they recreated his house wherever it is, and the the spook room. He had a, a seance room. And he claimed that and people get mad, I don't usually bring it up, because I know a lot of people in AA and Al Anon and people like that, and they all get upset where he said that he got, uh, he was on a Ouija board and he got the help from a 15th century monk by the name of Boniface who helped him create the 12 steps and the 12 traditions, helped, helped him write it. And people said, no, oh, it's not really true. And I go, it's actually on the site if you go and check this. I mean, he was making these kind of claims that he was, he had a, he was doing seances and the other guy was doing the seances yeah. too. They were, they were sort of on, because he had the experience in, what is it, 33, 34, this experience where he called up to God and suddenly this, this thing comes. So he was, his whole life was filled with very sort of bizarre paranormal events. It was and, the, and the purpose that they're doing it with these six months to live people is to make it easier for them to pass through the... Yeah, you resolve all your problems. Right. Yeah. Thank you. you when you first spoke of that, you spoke of they. They said when you get to the end and, and the life, everything you believe is a lie kind of thing. They meaning the people that are well, that facilitating was, the experiments. Well, that, that, was a, that was a, a, a statement by the guy from Harvard. Was doing the LSD. I can't remember his name escapes me. He's the one that used the reality tunnel ex expression. Timothy Leary. Timothy Leary. That he said that he called it the reality tunnel. When you get the other end, you realize everything you you, you thought was right is is, is a total lie. In the back there. Have you heard of Stuart and Doctor Stuart Emerald? Yes, I I I, I watch a lot of his videos. He's here in Tucson. He lives here. Yes, and you have the big consciousness con right. thing. The problem with the, the only problem I have with theirs, they're they're on the leading edge. They're doing the microtubular thing. It's they're still trying to make it into a physical world. Like the consciousness is coming from the microtubulars, and it's like it, it, it's not going to be a physical thing. The the uh, whatever is coming, you can say whatever you want inside the brain. Whatever is happening, whatever is to me, there is no football game inside the TV. And no matter what anyone says, there's there's not a football game going on there. Yeah, I agree. Um, I believe there's personally. From my life experiences, yeah. that there's a unified field, yeah. and you have to tap into it. Whether you're going to exactly. be a great piano player, or whether you're going to, you have to tap it. You have to. Do, you can't yeah. have a closed mind. Yeah. And the, I think sure. society does everything they can, or whoever's in control, to block our thinking. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you have to really think sure. outside of the box for yeah. any of this stuff. And we're getting it. I mean, because yeah. now a lot of neurologists are starting to realize that the brain is like a like a receiver exactly. type thing, and that it's the old idea that you tap into the field. And I always make the joke because I always people talk about the fact that I can talk very very fast. And I say if you actually think that there are neurons in my head, 
who are running around saying, oh, put this word in, okay, now put this word in, put this word in. There's absolutely no way this is happening. There's a bunch of neurons, because do the neurons have brains? How do they know, when, you know, to go to the third floor, to the third filing cabinet, and pull this word out, and, and they have a little woman with a little bun on her head that she's checking the grammar, and somebody's putting the accent, and someone's moving my hands and my mouth and stuff. You've got to realize, when you start looking at how this actually works, it's very, very complex. And it's, it's, it's a field. It's, uh, it's almost like, is the world, that's one of the other things I got in this download, is the world random or is, is it pattern? So is it fractal? You start looking at this fractal stuff. Everything's a fractal. Everything like, with the holograms and stuff like that, where it's, it's less random. I mean, what we think is like, you know, all these random things and these par particles all just sort of banged into each other and create a brain and the brain creates consciousness and that's where I have the disagreement with the people who are doing the peer reviewed consciousness studies say hammer off and these guys is that they're still trying to verify the, the, the fact that consciousness creates the mind and I say absolutely not the, the observer creates the particle on the back wall yeah I want to ask you too because we're, we're on the same page yeah. <laughs> um, I think some animals they're tame when other animals aren't because they're tapped into the unified field. Yeah. And they're, they're a channel and they know exactly when they're safe and when they're not. Oh. Yeah. And, and yeah, we sort of assume that we are the only consciousness. Yeah. And that's a real idea of like, what's the definition of consciousness? It's awareness. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, no, we can kill 41 million cows a year because they're not conscious, they don't have souls, they're, they're just objects, we can use them. And when you get to this thing with the dual slit experiment, you realize that even particles, like when you take the two particles, you know, the, with the entangled particles where you change the one spin and the one and the other one from the other side of the universe will change instantaneously, it's aware. Con particles are aware. It's all the way up and it's just a different level of awareness. I was mentioning this, we were talking about healing, there's a thing called the Bankston method. And it's supposed to be the Cadillac of all energy healing methods. I was trained in Chicago for this. And what they do is they take, they take um, ego images. So it's your ego is the problem. Your ego says, I'm here, I'm separate, I'm special, I, you know, I have so much material and people think about me. And it's this ego is running things. So what you do is take these ego images. And what they train you for this healing method is that you take 20 images, at least 20, and then you memorize them. And they teach you how to memorize these images. And then you, you start to go faster and faster and faster. And they actually teach you how to, you can spin a thousand of these images a second in your head. And they show you how to do this. So you take these ego images. And what the idea is, you're trying to get the ego to go for coffee. That's the problem. It's the left brain. It's the ego mind, that little chatter in your mind when you're being hypnotized and saying, oh, you're not being hypnotized. You're making this up. And this kind of stuff, and it's you're, you're bad. You, 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 this is all bullshit, you know. And this sort of stuff. And what they're doing is they, the ego images is watching these things. Like I want a new car, and it's going to be blue, and it's going to have this and that. And you get these ego images, and you send the ego for coffee. And when you get the ego out of the way, the left brain, the, the, the sort of the conscious mind, then the healing power can come through. And what happens is, because you shut down the left brain, the right brain is now in charge, and it's pulling it out of the field, and you, your left hand gets hot. And I could not believe it, because I've never had really many parallel experiences. When I was in this training session, and we went to, for the training, for the practice, and my hand went hot, and I went, oh my God, this is for real. And so what they're doing is the this, this same thing, is, this, is to shut down the, the, I say the left brain, that's the way I describe it, but if, you, if you're familiar with even Alexander, the guy who had the famous near-death experience, the guy 20 years from Harvard University, a neurologist, he said the first thing he realized when he came out of that experience was, oh my God, consciousness is not in the brain. It was his first thing. And what he says is the neurocortex. So what he's saying, it's, the, it's the, actually the reptilian brain that's actually the intuitive brain because what happens is when you have the, the neurocortex, that's the, the speech, that's the ego, that's the new brain, and he, so he says you're putting the neurocortex for coffee. You're trying to cut it out, and when you cut that out, then you can tap into the field. So when I'm sitting there, and I'm tuning out in a, a call and Andrews lecture, and I've got what I call contact modalities. I've got about 26, so you can use, Desta has a method that she uses, you can have drumming, you can have music, you can have pain, you can bang your head against a pole, you can have a near-death experience, and these are all contact modalities that pop you out of the physical world into this field, and like I have this tuned-in book where I talk about musicians and how many musicians 
songs came in dreams. Some of those famous songs came instantaneously like that, or they came in dreams. They get in the field, they pull it back down, and everybody goes, ah, you're crazy. You, know, you, didn't, you didn't get that sort of stuff. And you realize there's a field out there, and your brain is just a receiver, and there's ways to get into that field. Can I ask you one more thing yeah. on that? Because I 100% agree with you. But then recently I've, I've been reading that feelings start in the gut before the brain registers. So I'm thinking the whole body's a circuit. The whole body. I would agree. The whole yeah. body. So it's not just the brain. It's, we're a circuit. Or something. Yeah. You you're all, all work together. That's why I say with the thing with yeah. where I'm talking. Is you go, it's not just talking, you have you have accents, you, your tongue, your your lips. Or when, when something happens to you, you say, I'm conscious in my head. But when somebody drops a hammer or, or you smash your finger, the, it, the pain is not in your head, it's in your finger. You're conscious completely. Your whole body is conscious. It's one unit. And we have to sort of realize this, the fact that it's this unbelievable uh, system that we haven't even begun to start to explain how the, how the, all this stuff works. So that you have you're right with the, with the people with the with the stomach and this kind of stuff where there's different centers and different consciousness and every cell. That's why I say this idea of oneness. My big thing is always oneness. That you are just a cell in in a in a in a body of the earth. That you have your job to do. And if you keep the ego out of it and say, okay, I'm going to redivide. I'm not going to die. I'm just going to keep dividing, and then you become a cancer cell. And it's the whole idea is to do your little job, and you're part of the one. And, and that concept, that it's all connected, and it all works as, as, as one unit, and it all works very, very well until we get the ego in the way and say, okay, we're going to take over from here. That's when it all starts to go south. In the back there? Uh, this is really interesting because what you're describing, they're also talking about what AI, <coughs> artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. You can have two robots on a stage and the robots can access information from the cloud, which is the AI version of universal consciousness. Yeah. And this robot can learn stuff from the something, and this other robot on the other stage will instantly know it. So the only problem I have is what you're describing interface with artificial. What they're doing with artificial intelligence. See, I, I the only problem I have with artificial intelligence. I say that you cannot have artificial intelligence until you've got biology. You have to have Steve Mira, we were talking to him, and he talks about bio boards from 20 years ago. So what I say is you can take, the idea behind consciousness is if you get a, a system that's complex enough, suddenly, oh, right. the consciousness just pops up, and it's never going to happen. As long as you've just got equipment. So you can take, there's, I think, 8, 8 billion computers, and there's 6, 6 billion cell phones, or whatever. So they're all the computers. So you've got 14 billion computers. You can link all those computers together, you can turn them all on, and nothing is going to happen. Nothing's going to happen until you put a consciousness behind one of those computers to program it, to put the material in there. Nothing happens. You can wire them up, do whatever, nothing's going to happen. So you need the you need that consciousness element. So people have this idea, they have, have this idea we're going to take these robots and we're going to, you know, send them to to wherever Mars, then we're going to load the consciousness. And I go, like, what do you think? Consciousness is like an MP3 file or something? Or you're just going to load it in there? You've got to realize, consciousness is everything. All your cells, everything in your body is conscious. It's all working together as one. It's not like you're going to pull this sort of... <coughs> right, but you've got, you have somebody like Ray Kurzweil, who's developing nanotechnology, nanoparticle computers, yeah. and he sees that the entire universe is not intelligent, is not sentient. And so he's going to send out his nanoparticle computers across the universe yeah. so suddenly the universe will become intelligent. <laughs> and he says, well, and they ask him, well, does God exist? And he says, well, well not yet. Ray <laughs> Kurzweil is, yeah. is God waiting to in, make the whole universe intelligent. And was don't these, are these people smart enough to figure out what kind but, of... But they get a reputation because in the, in the um, world of science, they are the modern priests of the modern world. And you do not sort of step over the material. That's why I had so much trouble when I went to the consciousness thing. is because a lot of the UFO community is still in the nuts and bolts thing. They still have this thing. So they'll bring a PhD, even though he's sort of against UFOs, they'll bring him into lecture because he's a PhD, and it's like, we, we, we're like Rodney Dangerfield, we get no respect, we need to, and so people will do stupid things to get respect, and that's, if so if you're in the scientific world, and you want to be funded, that's why they're using this threat thing with To The Stars, like, uh, 
Jeremy Corbell talks about the fact, he said, it was called, and he was talking to the Nimitz people before this incident occurred, it was called AAVs, uh, Aerial, um, <coughs> Anomalous Aerial Vehicles. He said as soon as it became public, it was changed to AATs, Anomalous Aerial Threats. And the, the idea behind that is it's the same thing as when you're appeasing science, you want to say, oh, we're just being cool here, we're not talking about spirituality or anything like that. And when you, when you want to fund this program, what they're doing is they want to fund it so they say it's a threat. Because if, you, if people say, oh, the tooth stars want to go to the stars. Maybe two stars does, but the Department of Defense does not. That's not their mission. That's the mission of NASA. If you look at NASA's budget, it's $19 billion. If you look at the De Defense Department, it's $713 billion. If the Defense Department is running the program, they're not going to the stars. They're going to build weapons with it. And that's this, my big fear about this whole thing with Skinwalker Ranch, is the fact that if you are going to try to develop weapons out of this thing, it's going south. And there's a story that I, it was my lecture, but I'll tell you now. There's a guy, he's a priest, he was the head of MUFON for, for Nebraska. And I was going to get him an interview, he, was, he can't do it this week, I'm going to do it next week. But he was contacted by a guy from the Depart uh, Defense Intelligence Agency and from the NSA. And they were trying to develop weapons. They were taking the parapsychology stuff, they were doing the channeling, they were dealing with a, a group called the Nine. And they were trying to weaponize the material they were getting from these aliens, they thought were aliens. And they were trying to weaponize it. And so they come to this guy, and he's a priest. So they come to this guy, and they basically say to him, uh, we got we got real problems here. This thing's turning on us. And we need, it's like almost like, we need you to come to the uh, Pentagon and uh, do an exorcism. And, and it was the whole thing. Yeah, and the, the, he links it into the fact that they were trying to weaponize this thing. And there's an example that was shown. I mentioned this documentary from the 1970s, uh, UFOs that has begun. It's on the internet. When they had that, there's a woman who was, um, her name was Frances Swan. She was um, a channeler. She was one of the last in the 1950s. It was all blondes. It was all, uh, you know, human type beings. And then with Betty Hill in 61, suddenly the greys all started. And then there was no greys before Betty Hill. So it was all these blonde types. So she was sort of the last, she was channeling this alien by the name of Alpha that the Canadians were dealing with. So she's channeling this alien, and he's a good guy. He's a guy that came when she was putting up decorations in 1954 for the for the Halloween party, and he talked to her, and he she fell in love with this guy. She said he was, he was, he was handsome, and, and alpha, and she starts getting these messages, and CIA picks up on her, intelligence, defense, uh, and, and, and the Navy picked up on her. She teaches a Navy intelligence guy how to, how to make this contact. He said, uh, I wanted to do this contact. She says, well, what did I just teach you how to do? She sits down, she puts her hand on his right shoulder, and all of a sudden he's doing this automatic writing. And he goes, holy cow! And he goes running back, he's working for the CIA, he goes to the Na National Photographic Interpretation Center, where they analyze all the U-2, all the SR-71. The guy that ran it, his files are actually, we were looking at his files here at the University of Arizona. He, the guy here, James McDonald, was dealing with this guy. His name was Art Lundahl. He was the head of the Weird Desk, the head of the UFO thing at the CIA. And he was dealing with this guy and uh, James McDonald. So they go back, and Lundahl is running this, this thing. He's actually the guy that went in to brief President Kennedy on the Cuban Missile Crisis because he was a photographic expert. He was showing, here's a missile, here's this, and he was showing Kennedy all these things in Cuba. And he was the guy that did this, but he was fascinated with UFOs. So he goes there, and this guy gets taught how to channel this alien. And this is, remember, this is a positive alien. This is a, you know, Alpha is a good guy. So he's channeling this alien, and um, he learns how to do it. He goes running back to the CIA, and Art Lundahl, and this is in this documentary. Art Lundahl provides this for the documentary. It's 1959, July 1959. They're in there, and the guy comes in, he said, she showed me how to do it, because they've been in contact with her for five years. They knew about her. It, she taught me how to do this. And Art says, okay, sit down, let's talk to the alien. So he sits down and they start communicating. Is there a special religion? And they're asking this and different stuff, trying to test whether this guy's getting accurate information. And they sit, suddenly decide, yeah, this, this seems to be accurate information. And they're dealing with this AFA. So then Art Landau says, okay, we'd like you to prove yourself. And then AFA says, the guy changes from automatic writing to talking. And he said, what do you want? And he said, we'd like you to show yourself. And then Alpha says, when? Now. Alpha says, go to the window. And they go to the window, and this is in this documentary. A friend 
Robert Friend, who ran the Blue Book, is actually telling his story. And he goes to the window and he said, and this UFO flew by the window in the broad daylight, over top of the Capitol. So they call Robert Friend in, this big panic and this sort of stuff. So anyway, they, so they do this thing and they make this contact. And then Robert Friend wants to analyze it. So he goes back to Wright Patterson Air Force Base and he tells the general, he says, this, wo this woman's on to something. They're, they're on to something. There's something going on. They've made a contact. I'd like to follow up on it. The general said, an agency is handling it hands off. And that's the CIA is now handling it. So the CIA is dealing with this. And of course, they start to want to try to weaponize this thing. So they're going to figure out how we're going to use this kind of stuff for whatever, mind control, weapons, all sorts of stuff. The guy comes back in the 1980s. And I actually contacted Francis Swan before she died. And I said, is this story true? The guy comes back in the 1980s and he said, get them away from me. They're driving me crazy. I can't get rid of them. You've got to get rid of them. And she said, I told you not to deal with the... With, and she had this religious thing, good and bad. I told you not to deal with the bad ones. And you had it coming. And this guy, this guy actually comes back to her in the 1980s and they're just driving him nuts. So it starts with this good alien and suddenly in the 1980s, almost like this, this guy, uh, this uh, guy from Nebraska, they come and they say, this thing's out of control. And that's this whole thing where I think that the, the problem is, is that if you want to weaponize this thing, if you're looking at evil intentions as to what you're going to use this technology for, it's almost like that, to me, the intelligence is, is neutral. So if you come to Skinwalker Ranch and it's a neutral phenomena, and you say, okay, I, I, you know, I, I think this is going to be a bad phenomena, the, the phenomena goes, oh, evil aliens? Oh, we can do that. <laughs> and it's whatever you want it to be. So this is this thing. That's what, what George Knapp said. The people had the worst experience. And not everybody at the ranch. So if you say it's an independent phenomenon that just happened at the ranch, George Knapp didn't see anything. John Alexander didn't see anything. Um, uh, Corbell didn't see anything. And these people were on the ranch all the time. But then you had Eric Davis, who has a PhD. He has a UFO sighting when he's graduating here at the University of Arizona, he gets his degree here, he has the party here in Tucson, and this big UFO goes flying by, him and his wife are watching this UFO, he sees stuff all the time. So it attracts to certain people, and that's this connection, that certain people will, will, will manifest, certain people will be in the phenomena, and that's why I say, when I see someone, and they're having these sightings, I, I always say, I, I think they're trying to contact you, are you trying to talk to them? And then the, the one guy from California, I said to him, I said, I think they, they want to contact you. This is a, a big Hollywood guy. I said, they, I think they want to contact you. And so he said to the alien, he said, okay, if you're an alien or whatever you, whatever you are, put something in my head that I don't already know. And he said, in his voice, in his head, he hears the word biocentrism. He goes, that's that. And he goes, he looks it up. And what biocentrism is, it's the same, it's a theory I've been talking about, holographic universe, what a lot of people in the spiritual world is talking about, is the whole idea. Time, space, or illusions, consciousness is primary. Life creates the universe, not the other way around. Life is primary. So this guy actually contacts this guy. His name is Dr. Robert Lanz. It's a book I recommend you read. Dr. Robert Lanz is called Biocentrism. And then he wrote a second book called Beyond Biocentrism. Here's a guy, the first guy to clone an extinct species. He's a high-level biologist has these experiences, isn't opening up what he had, basically goes to this whole thing. What is reality? And so I spend most of my time now looking at what is reality. What have we got wrong? Because if, it, if it's strange, that just means we're making a false assumption. We're not figuring it out properly. What is the proper assumption? When you start making the right assumptions, almost like if you're doing a calculation, if you add and subtract in step number one, you can do all the calculations you want, you are never gonna get the right answer. You have to do every step right, you gotta make the right assumptions. Is it one life? Is it, is it nuts and bolts or consciousness? All these different things. And when you get that and you listen to the experiencers, they start telling you these kind of things. You got this wrong, you got that wrong, and you start listening to them. Why, why would you not listen to people? Go ahead. Um, since we have you here, and you're an expert on presidential ufology, I'd, I'd like to kind of shift gears if we may. Um, <coughs> Uh, the issue was, was <laughs> Ancient Aliens came out with an episode in 2017 which was uh, very, uh, it promoted the concept that uh, if Hillary Clinton gets elected, she's going to give us disclosure. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, it, 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 over the course of the, of the film or the video, it's like, well, Donald Trump got elected, so now we're not going to get disclosure. I would like for you to tell us about Donald Trump yep. and Ron Pandalti and how the how that how that works where you go from 
magician <coughs> to Messiah. Because as I understand it, Ron Pandolfi mm -hmm. would be the magician. Yeah. And if he briefs President Trump yeah. on ufology, whatever Trump says, Trump will now become Ron Pandolfi's Messiah if he gives any kind of disclosure at all. So if we could kind of shift gears yeah. and get into that while we have you here for a few okay. more minutes, I'd love to hear it. Okay, I'll go through that. The way I describe it is the president knows. The president, in fact, I won't say who I heard from, but I, I heard it first the Pandolfi and a guy by the name of Mike Pillsbury and James Wolseley, who was the, the CIA director for Bill Clinton, were the guys who briefed Donald Trump. In December of 2016, they were together many days during that, that time. I've since heard from a very reliable source that Lou Elizondo said President Trump was, was briefed. What I disagree with is, is I really don't believe they know as much as people. I don't really believe they're going to star systems. So I think they're basically, as Eric Davis said, and Eric Davis is the guy with security clearances. I've known Eric Davis for a number of years, and he can be very aggressive, very sort of con confrontational, but he knows what he's talking about. He's not lying. And he said we had a crash saucer program, and we shut it down in 1989 because we just we couldn't figure out anything. We got crafts, yes, we got crafts, we got all this kind of stuff, but we really don't know what's going on. We and and that would agree. So I look at people like Big Bob Bigelow, a billionaire, uh, Joe Furmich, who had hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, dot com executive. Uh, you look at uh, uh, Elon Musk. I mean, if we've got this high tech, why is Elon Musk going to use rockets to go to Mars? And rockets is five thousand year old technology. It would appear that these guys with all this money would find some way to bypass simple technology, that it's a money game. So you're going to build rockets because, you know, it's, it's, it's a money game. So the way I understand, this is the way I understand the president thing is. So Hillary was going to do it, and, and this was con asked, actually asked of um, Lavinda, who was, works for Tom DeLong, who was in the interview when they interviewed John Podesta. Most people don't. They did about a four or five hour interview with John Podesta for a documentary that Tom DeLong is going to release. So in this documentary they said, okay, well Hillary wouldn't have done it. And he said, no, you got to realize, we did. We had five, four, like four hours with, with John Podesta. He told us a lot of stuff. So if they suddenly decide, okay, we're not going to release this, we've got the tape. We're, we can force it. We can actually say, John told us this, John told us that. So they haven't released that kind of stuff, but John told them a lot of stuff. The way I think it works, there's a, there's a tape done by Brennan, and he talks about the briefing that he gave for Barack Obama. Barack Obama was given the intelligence, it's called the intelligence briefing. And there's a story that Jimmy Carter, when Jimmy Carter was given the briefing, he was crying, and uh, he was upset by what, what had happened. It happens in November, when the president's elected, it happens a couple weeks later, they give him the intelligence briefing. The way Brennan described it with, with, with Obama, and Obama said, when I was in the briefing, he said it was a good thing there was bars on the, on the, on the windows because I might have jumped out. And what, what Brennan says is there are different programs. So there's things that say Trump or Obama or somebody that you initiate. So you say, I'm going to do this program, Trump's this space program. So okay, I'm going to do this thing. So that's a presidential program. But there are programs that are run on behalf of the White House. So these programs have always run. And Brennan describes it's called a wake-up call. So he says in the briefing, you give the president the wake-up call, and you say, Mr. President, because these guys know nothing. This guy's, a, you know, Trump was a businessman, uh, Reagan was a, a governor. They know nothing about foreign policy. They know nothing about intelligence. They know nothing about anything. So you basically have to peel them in. That's, that's why the president doesn't take office until January the 20th when he's been elected in November. You've got to bring this guy up to speed. You've got to train him. How does the government work? How does intelligence work? What are you doing? So he says it's called the wake-up call. He says, Mr. President, here's how it works. We're doing this, we're doing this. In this country, we're doing this, we're doing this. And the president's going, oh my God, you know, we're overthrowing this country, we're killing this guy. We're and he goes through the whole thing, all this sort of stuff. And he says, Mr. President, this is done on behalf of the White House, on behalf of the presidents of the United States. This has been, it goes from president to president. And he said, he goes through the thing, and the president's just like freaking out, holy cow. And he said, okay, Mr. President, remember, when you put your hand on that Bible in Washington on Inauguration Day, Unless you tell us to stop, we're still going to be doing this and this and this and this. And I believe the UFO program is one of those. Because I, I, I go all the way through about different presidents. They all seem to be part of this, this whole thing where they, they knew, they just green-lighted the program. 
And the whole thing, I think the, the fallback is they really don't know as much as I think that people think they know, is they're just struggling to, to, to figure out how this thing works. It's almost like the, the To The Stars, or like um, some of the programs, is they know something's going on. Yes, something's going on, but when you start looking at these reports, you start looking at some of the stuff I was describing today, these people are so far ahead of what we are doing. It's, people think, okay, it's just this thing, we're going to get the little engine, we're going to pull a little free energy engine, and then tell the, the aliens to go to hell, and, and we're going to drive our SUVs for free. It is much more complex. When you start talking to the experiencers, and I do a lecture that I do, it's, it's on consciousness, where I talk about the people flying the craft. And I had the first woman who was actually in, in Tucson, no, in, in Phoenix, in 2013, where they said, are you going to talk to Pam? And I go, well, I talked to Pam, I must have agreed to talk to Pam. And they bring this Pam Dupuy in. She comes to the house where I'm staying in, in Phoenix. And she said, what does Stacey tell you about me? I go, uh, I don't know, I'm supposed to talk to you. Oh, it's good. She comes walking in. She's in her 70s. And she starts talking about, she's, you know, a remote viewer, she's this and that, and she's been abducted. And, all. and you hear all these stories and go, whatever. And she's going through the stories. And then she says, oh, and I'm just flying to craft last night. And I went, what? You're flying to craft? And it's just like, this woman's in her 70s. You're flying the craft? And I just got 37 years. I thought I'd never heard anything like that. You're flying the craft? They let you fly the craft? And she said, yeah, I've, fl I've flown three of her models. And so I said, well, how do you fly a craft? And she said, oh, you do it with your mind. Mm -hmm. And I have a guy actually on my radio show this Tuesday from Utah who's one of the guys that flew the craft. I've got 50 people. I've gathered these people. They all say the same thing. You go into the craft. There's beings behind you. You don't know if they're humans or they're, they're aliens or whatever. You stand there. And you're looking at a panel, and it's either a ball or it's a flat panel. And then, and then they go, okay, go ahead. And then I had an F-16 jet, jet fire, a retired U.S. Air Force colonel out of Los Angeles. And he's standing there and he said, and he said, I don't know what to do. And he hears this voice behind him and said, you know what to do, just do it. And then he goes up and puts his hand on his panel. And he said, he puts both his hands on the panel. And he said, something, you slide the craft. And whatever you think is what the craft does. So the guy from, from, from Utah that I'm interviewing Tuesday night, what he told me is he said, they said to him, where would you like to go? And he said, I would like to see the Milky Way from a distance. And they said, this is going to be very rough for a second, and just be prepared. And he said, for one second, there's this like, horrible sort of um, G-force thing. And the second second, he said, suddenly he looked, and he was outside the Milky Way in the middle of space. Two seconds. We don't have, I don't care what it is, we do not have that technology, there's no way. And the other thing they talk about is the fact that the craft is alive. That every says the same thing, it's almost like they're reading off a cue card. So someone says, I flew the craft. I say, okay, go through. And I can just check it off. Next, they say, there's beings behind them, they're standing there, they don't know what to do. They tell, do you do it? They don't tell them what to do, they just say, do it. You put your hand on this panel or on this ball, and suddenly you're flying the craft. What You become one with the craft. You and the craft are one, you're one unit. And whatever you think is what the craft does, and the craft is alive. The craft actually thinks. It knows it can talk to other ships all over the place. It's all one thing. There's no way they have that, that technology. So the president does know. There was a, there's a statement, and I, I'll give you a, a, this is the first time I've talked about this in public. When we were leaving, there was a guy from Australia. And there was supposed to be a meeting. You guys had set up a meeting, and I didn't, we, I didn't, I didn't know this meeting was taking place. This guy was desperate to talk to me. I want to talk to the in the morning, we're leaving at 11. So he comes up and he says, I, I, need, I need to talk to you for 20 minutes. I said, well, Destin and I are leaving, we're going to Tucson, we have really enough time. And he says, I want you to read this document. He shows me this document. And the document is an interview, and I can't say too much about it because I'm still trying to get the document. I said, well, send me the document. He said, I can't send the document, and it's all this, you know, fear stuff and whatever. I said, they know you got it. I mean, they, they know you've got this document. <laughs> and what the document is, it's a document that basically confirms absolutely for sure. You can take my word. I will guarantee you, 43 years of my career, this is for real. It's a, it's a, it's, there's five people in the document. And I told them the one is a person that nobody would really know, but he was in a document that I had been leaked documents related to the, uh, what's called the UFO Working Group in the 1980s. This guy was the cover page, and I've always held the cover page because it was a restricted cover page, and this guy's name's on it, so I withheld it. So I, I recognized this guy's name, oh, I know this guy, and I said, when he dies, I can release the document. This guy's still alive. I'm waiting for this guy to die so I can release this, this document, these notes. Anyway, so this guy's name on it. The other people are one of the highest level intelligence people in the United States. There's no way you're going to doubt it. 
the guy that's doing an interview is a guy connected to, to the stars, absolutely reputable, I'm not going to say who he is. And the other person is, were this document, it's an interview, it's not a, a classified government document, it's an interview of this person interviewing this very high level intelligence person. Unquestionable, this guy would know what's going on. And they're talking back and forth. And basically, he says, MJ-12 was for real. And I worked for years, because I was involved in the original thing with MJ. The group exists. There is a group called MJ-12. No, maybe it's called different, but that group does exist. There's a small group of 12, 15 people who control the thing. And there's all the stuff funnels up to the different agencies to them. That was confirmed in this document. And the other thing that was confirmed in the document is we have a crash saucer program. That, that they have got crash material. And so when I, when I saw this document, I'm, I'm trying to get this. And during the, doc, during the interview, the guy's asking questions to this high-level intelligence guy. And he's, he, he'll answer the question. And then he comes to this thing and he says, core secret, can't talk about it. And then he asks another question and answers it. Another one, core secret, can't talk about it. And the, the thing with the core secret is, in 1987, L. Putoff, who runs one of the top guys in Two of the Stars, Kit Green, who run, used to run the weird desk at the CIA, and um, help it off, Kit Green, and Jacques Allais. They get together in a meeting at a Denny's. I don't know I mean, what state it was in. They get in a meeting in, in 1987. And these are very high level. Like Kit Green and Hal Putoff probably have the longest held top secret SCI clearances in the country. They had top secret SCI clearances in 1970. They've still got them. So these are very high level guys. And what they wanted to do was determine in 1987 what do we know for sure. And what they came up with was what's called the core story. The core story is yes, we're being visited by some sort of intelligence. There have been crashes and we haven't done very well in back engineering the crashes. So that's where I think the whole thing falls apart. The president knows, so Trump is briefed and they basically say, what I was told is he just said, okay, go ahead with it. They're running the program. This is a program that's been running since the 1970s. And that's the point I've made. When Tom DeLong came forward, I said, oh, they're doing it again. It's the same thing. It's the same. What they do is they take a document and they change the document. They alter the document a little bit and they release the document. Or they put it through somebody. And it's always plausible deniability. Same as the president. You, if, if everybody knew that the president was running the show, he'd be inundated. 5,000 reporters would descend on the, on the White House and, and no, nobody dissents because everybody thinks, ah, the president's an idiot. He doesn't know anything. Nobody's telling Donald Trump. They don't tell Obama. Mm -hmm. There's somebody, somebody else running the government or whatever. And they want you to believe that. Whether it's true or not, but they want you to believe that. Is because then you're not going to ask the president. So the, the, they know, and it's this plausible liability thing. And they, what I was told is he just said, go ahead with it. I'm not interested. He actually said, because he was asked a question about go ahead with it. Uh, and it was asked by the New York Times about Hillary. Hillary's talking about UFOs. <coughs> what about Mr. Trump? And Trump says, well, that sounds like it has to do with outer space. I'm not interested. So he's not interested, but he just sort of greenlights the program. Okay, if you want to do this thing. Because they really, all they're trying to do is move the story out into the public. So that's what I think is at the bottom core of this thing, that the presidents do know, but how much they, they really know, there's a, a technology thing that they're working on, which is the, the bottom line to the thing. But um, Obama, same thing. Obama was making all these jokes. He was up there, he was talking about it all the time. He said, oh, the, the aliens are telling us what to do. That may be actually true. I mean, he, he was basically actually saying the same thing. Or, you know, because uh, uh, they said to him, because Bill Clinton was on, this is this Kimmel thing. Where Kimmel, every time somebody comes on Kimmel, Kimmel says, "Oh, if I was the president, the first thing I'd do is go put my hand on the Bible. Uh, after I got the hand, I'd be my, the Bible would still be warm. I'd be heading for the White House to look for the files on UFOs." So he asked Bill Clinton, and Bill Clinton makes this this goofy thing where he goes, "Well, you know, I, you know, I, I, I I'm, I'm sort of embarrassed to say I, I tried to find stuff and I really couldn't find anything. I pulled the Roswell files and I determined there was no crash at Roswell, but really I didn't get anything." And it's like, what? You said you didn't get anything, and then you said you got the Roswell files? I mean, you can't have it both ways. So he played this game. So when Barack Obama came on, Kimmel said, well, you know you know that they, they watched Bill Clinton, because there was a guy named Ben Hansen who had done a, a, a study on, on Bill Clinton's body language and believed that he was lying. That he was making this whole thing up when he, was describe, when he was describing the UFO thing. So that's why he says to Barack Obama, he says, you know they're going to be watching you every time you swallow that, that he's going to be watching. And then, so Brock is sitting there, and then when they ask him the question, they said, well, what did you do when you got to the White House? What did you do? Did you, did you look for the UFO files? And then what Brock, what Brock says 
and they watch his lapel pin, this high-def TV, and he's got the little lapel pin on, the little USA lapel pin. He's breathing 43 times a minute. He's hyperventilating when he gets asked that question. And he said, I can't reveal anything. He basically says, I can't. He doesn't deny it. And then when they get Bush up there, and they said to Bush, after when George Bush comes up, they said, okay, what about you? What, what did you do when you went to the White House? Did you, did you? And he said, well, that's the same question my daughter's asking. And then Kibble says, what? So you, did you, what did you tell your daughter? Nothing. He said, so that's what you're going to tell us? You're not telling us nothing? I'm not telling you nothing. So he basically confirms, yeah, they were briefed. And this is this impression. Yeah, go ahead. So what um, I was going to ask well, you is what, okay. what, the in, what is the intent? Um, all of these stories, you're talking about the, the feathers, the dimes, the quarters. What is the intent of the aliens to want to keep communicating with us? So what is their intent well, with us? Whether it's the government or whether it's the aliens, there's three things, there's three possibilities. They're disclosing. Neither is disclosing. The government won't disclose it, stand the president up and tell you what's going no, on. No, no, I'm talking yeah. about what is the aliens' Well, I'm intent. telling you, okay, so the aliens, if the aliens wanted to disclose, they'd land on the White House lawn and tell us what's going on. So they're not disclosing. They're not covering up either. Because if they wanted to cover up, they would turn the lights off on the UFOs and just do stuff, because they can block your memory. Why do abductees, why do they, there's actually the one where they actually take the scoop mark out of the guy and they say, it is now time for you to remember. Why do they allow you to remember parts of your abduction experience? So they're not, they're not disclosing, and they're not covering up, they're doing something in between. They're doing the breadcrumb thing. Instead of confronting you face to face and saying, I'm here, this is for real, you go like, it just offensive. That's the way we do it. Right. So what they're doing is the breadcrumb thing is they're trying to gradually leak it out so you come to this conclusion that you raise consciousness slowly, slowly, slowly. It's almost like I say, when did African Americans get the rights to be human beings? When did gay rights get the rights? And you go, uh, I don't know when it was. I don't know, 20 years ago. It's just going to happen. It's almost like now, like most people after they release those videos in the New York Times, Washington Post, and Political, everybody goes, ah, yeah, yeah, UFOs. Yeah. It's, it's for real. They've moved the, the, the thing. That's what the government's trying to do. The government's, they're not going after like a, a Democrat or a Republican. If you are a, a, a vote guy, you're not going after Democrats or Republicans because they're not voting for you. If you're a Democrat, they're not going to vote for you. You're going after the swing voters. You're going after the people who are in the middle who really don't know. And that's what they're doing is they're shifting the middle over a little bit. More and more people believe, and it's going to, it's a consciousness thing where it's going to get to a certain point where it just flips like that. And suddenly everybody sort of accepts it because you can't. The, the Brookings report said in 1962 or whenever they wrote it was, yeah, unless you acclimatize the people slowly to the fact that they're not alone in the universe, the lower society will die out. That can, that can be killed. So they're both doing this gradual disclosure thing. The, the government's doing it, and so are the aliens doing the same thing. In fact, the government may have learned it from, the, from whoever the intelligence is, that they're doing this gradual thing where they're just sort of leading you. Because I said in 1970s, it was a completely different world than it is now in terms of what we know and, and all this sort of stuff. And the government is definitely leaking this stuff. There's, in fact, I was contacted. I was contacted by a guy. They're going to do a documentary on what's called the Avery. I won't get into it. And he said, I got a phone call from U.S. intelligence to talk to you. I go, come on. I'm a Canadian. Why would U.S. intelligence say to phone to contact me? And said, oh, you're some expert on the Avery. We want to do a documentary. We want to put it in Hollywood. So that's the thing is when you're in Hollywood, if you're doing a documentary on UFOs or the CIA, if you're doing a documentary on the CIA, I'm in the CIA, I'm Chase Brandon, this guy that came out and said Roswell was real, it's extraterrestrial, and there were cadavers. I come to you, I've got two choices. I can either kill you or I can come to you and say, oh, I hear you're doing a documentary on the CIA. Is that right? Oh, yeah. You ever been to the CIA? I'd like to go to CIA? We can take you to CIA. We can help you. We show what agents are like. And everybody goes, oh, I can go to the CIA? And they drag you in and they manage you. That's why I called it managing sure. magic. They manage you. They push you down the road. They're not forcing you. They, they're dragging you down the road. And I call it magic because it's all paranormal phenomena. So they're, in, in fact, in the, in the CIA, it's called phenomenology. It's not called UFOs. It's called phenomenology. It's remote doing. It's all these weird things put together. And they realize there's this field. And if you can control the field, we can build weapons, we can control people's minds. And that's why when the Canadians did the document in 1950, the Canadians are told by the Americans, mental phenomena is involved. Six months later, after that memo was released by the Canadians, and it was a top secret memo, it was declassified in 1978, but in, it was written in 1950. Six months after that documentary, MK Ultra started about, about an hour down the road in Montreal at McGill University by Ewan Cameron. So the Canadians have been told mental phenomena is involved. So the whole MK Ultra thing is not like we want to drug people and do whatever. It's like, oh my God, there's something going on. And the re why did the Canadians know that consciousness was involved? 
and I say, is because in the 70s, we didn't know about Roswell. Then Roswell came and it was four dead aliens. Then the latest stories are three dead aliens and one live alien. And all the people were describing this alien standing there, and it was talking in people's heads. So if you're the CIA, and you got this alien talking in people's heads, like, oh my God, but we'd love to have that. That's why I say they did MKUltra. They're trying to figure out how consciousness works because they're trying to weaponize it. They realized that this alien in 1947 was talking in people's heads and we could use this. This is technology. That's all. And that's the big fear of me. If NASA was running it, then you'd say, okay, great, we're going to the stars. But if the Defense Department is running this thing and they're calling it threats, they're going to try to weaponize it and the phenomena will play the game. If you want to be bad guy, I think the phenomena is neutral, God is neutral, the universe is neutral, it will play the game. And I could think we'd be in a lot of trouble. But artificial intelligence, basically, that would be, in my opinion, what do you think? I think there's just um, information, because that's just like computers of human intelligence connected all together. That's just information. That's not intelligence. The intelligence would be awareness. Yeah, well, the intelligence would be the person behind the computer. That's right. why I say it, that, yeah. that you can wire all the computers together. Yeah, and you're still going to get just and, information. And even the information has to be put in by, con by consciousness. There's no information inside those 14 billion right. computers until someone sits there and programs and puts the information in. So what the, the, the and there was a story that they, uh, when I did my Inspired, the guy who got the first thing about the, the computer was 1950. It was a download experience where he, he's the guy that did the thing at, at, at Berkeley University where they had the, the mouse, he invented the mouse, they had the screen, they're talking back and forth in 1967, the first computer demonstration, this major, major thing. This was a download. He had this in 1950 in his head. Mm -hmm. And this is the whole thing that the, the internet may be something that was given to us to teach us about collective consciousness, because that's all it is. And it's the same idea. You go to the internet, if you want to find out something, you go Google and you find it. It's the same thing in this thing. If you can figure out how to get into the field, you can just like Google and hack the field and pull the, all the information is in the field. That's the basic idea. There's a cache field. Everything is there. All the inventions are there. Everything is there. It's the ability to go into the field and pull the stuff out. And that's why experiences are so important because 40% of all experiences, I even had Tony, this guy, and he's talking to me, he said, I had this weird experience. And he is really had no in, in, sort of knowledge about UFOs. He said, this really weird experience. I had this dream. I, I was talking to this owl. And he said, oh, yeah, how big was the owl? And he said, it was pretty big. And then he said, and, and he said, the weird thing was, and here's a guy who doesn't know anything, but I know that 40% of all people who are experiencers say, at one point during their experience, they knew the answer to everything in the universe. And he said to me, so the weirdest thing was, he said, I knew the answer to everything in the universe. And I said, oh, you, you know that 40% of all people? And he's going, it was so weird. I knew it. And so how long did it last? He said, well, about a day, and it was sort of just faded away, like a dream, it just faded away. And I remember a reincarnation, I remember these kind of things, but I don't remember anything. And that's the whole the idea, is that all the answers are in the field. Like, if you're, if you're an experiencer, why would you make up a stupid story that you knew everything in the, in the universe? That's the stupidest thing you could possibly say. I mean, how would you defend that? But these 40% of people say they knew the answer to everything in the universe. It's all there. It's the ability to tap into the field. And that's why experiencers are so very important. Okay, over here. Yeah, question for you. I'm trying to piece together an understanding relative to the things that you've said about some of the different reports that I've listened to recently. Emory Smith has had a number of videos, maybe that person, um, interviews he's done with uh, David Wilcock, and he's talked about his, his experiences as part of a program to uh, do sampling of ET bodies and parts of ET bodies, and he's no longer involved in that. At the same time, I was listening to uh, reports from Linda Moulton Howe coming out of England about a group of people who witnessed a, um, a UFO type uh, phenomena and apparently an attack by military craft on that UFO to bring it down and then the recovery of UFO implying that there was, uh, she was sort of implying through the report and through the material that was coming from Mary Smith that there is this ongoing program to bring down UFOs for the purposes of recovering not only, I guess, the craft, but also the ETs to activate some sort of hybrid program that's part of this defense initiative that's associated with the idea of ETs or non-humans as being a threat and their presence on Earth as a threat, and the military has to do something to respond to that. What is your thoughts on that? Well, that's a good question. I, I, I have lots, lots of encounters with Linda about this thing about the evil aliens, and I would say, Linda, no, I, I don't buy this. <coughs> The technology thing, the more I look at the technology, the less I think the government has. 
They, they, like Finland has this, you know, her whistleblowers. And the problem with whistleblowers is there's, there's so many of them, just, you can't verify this stuff. So she has whistleblowers that say, we're actually trading. We actually have this technology and we're trading, we're going to other star systems. And I go, mm. the more I look at it, the more it's like, no, we really don't have anything. We, we understand that there's, you know, there's terahertz is involved, that they're modifying genes, that there's all these different things. But in terms of technology, I, I, I just don't see that we have this kind of stuff. And the, the battle, like I always say, and I, this way, because I, I, I don't watch the, the, the whistleblowers, it's so unverifiable. The thing I always say to Linda is this thing about battles, you know, like the, the, the beings are battling, and I'm going, but the beings are telepathic. So how do you sneak up on somebody? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Like, I mean, if, you're, if, if you're, I mean, the only way war works is you sneak up on a guy. And, 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 and you can see that aliens are, are, are precognitive. So they know what's going to happen in the future. So they know who's going to win the war. So if you know you're going to win the war, why would you start it? I mean, if somebody's going to, some, they're both precognitive. One of them knows they're going to win the war. And so this kind of things, I sort of leave it. It's just, I, know, I don't really argue it, but it, it's, it's where you try to think these things through. And there's a lot of people saying that we've got all this tech, and I, I see, seem to think that some of it may be just like bravado. Yeah, we got this thing under control, you know, and this kind of stuff. And then you start checking into it, and the more I look at it, especially with these high money guys, like like Bigelow, like why is Bigelow working on, you know, putting little sheds on Mars if he has all this sort of stuff? He could buy, he, and they all claim, like Furmage. I asked the question to Joe Furmage, who was this dot com guy, who spent $100 million on a, on, a, on a thing where they're trying to levitate this thing an inch off the ground. And they spent $100 million bucks, and it's like, well, if we got all this technology, what the hell does he spend $100 million? And he said, I've got, tech, I've got a high-level government and intelligence sources. So if he's got high-level government, what's he doing with this stupid levitation thing? Yeah. Where, and it's not working. Yeah. It's, it's basically gone south. And I asked a question. I said, ask Joe for me, do they have the secret space program? He said, no, they don't. And I asked Chris Bledsoe, who's Chris Bledsoe, his main contact is Jim Semivan. Jim Semivan is the director of To the Stars. He's this high-level guy who was an experiencer, who had the beings in his room in 1992 or whatever, and went to the CIA and said, what the hell's going on here? And they said, pretend it's a one-off, it's going to ruin your career or whatever. And after he retired, they, 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 they brought him in. I said, ask Jim Semivan, do they have the secret space run? Do they have all this super technology where they're... And I don't deny they're trying to shoot down the UFOs. Absolutely. They're, they're absolutely trying to do it but whether they have the ability to do this kind of stuff. And Jim Semivan said, we have high technology, we don't have that kind of stuff. That's what Jim Semivan said. In the back? Do you think we, um, my mind works overtime like yours, but <laughs> I, I think that there's an ancient race that are living on the planet with us, and we're the new kids on the block, and it's like, they're too stupid to let them know stuff. You know, they can just keep having their sightings. And you're right about our government. They only know so much. But I do think there are advanced beings that inhabit, or and yeah. they maybe do go to other planets. Yeah. But I think they're here. Yeah. It, 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 to me, it's irrelevant where they come because I've stopped. I was called now called the intelligence behind the phenomenon because there's so many different places it could be coming from. The fact is, there is an intelligence behind this phenomenon, and it's cognitive. It's very smart. Um, it has, has certain intentions. I think it's neutral, but there's an intelligence. So whether it comes from here or there or whatever. And there's the whole thing with portals. In January of 2016, CI started to leak through me and other people trying to get this idea we got these portals. And suddenly there was like six document, there's six movies in Hollywood that suddenly had portals in them and stuff. Now everybody's talking portals and they want this idea. And to me it was important, even though I didn't believe this Ron Gandolfi, who you mentioned, who's the, the guy who runs the weird desk right now. And I didn't, it was like, whatever Ron says is exactly the opposite. So Ron's putting all this stuff out, and it's like, he's just trying to put it out, but it, it's plausible deniability, so you don't know where you're going, everybody's bumping into each other, everybody's accusing people of stuff, and he just put up this idea of portals. And the idea of portals is, if portals are real, or the, the Zendra people, or the, the Mission Rama people call them Zendras, where they can open these international bubbles, and they've been able to do this around the world. There's a couple of these experiencers who Paula Harris, if you know Paula Harris, was in one of these Zenders twice. And if they can do this kind of stuff, then it's the whole nuts and bolts thing falls apart. They're not flying at the speed of, uh, at the speed of light through time and space. They are going through these gateways, these portal things. And the CIA started to leak this story. Now you hear everybody talking about these portal things, this whole thing with, with this popping in and out of, that's how they're moving. And that's the whole entangled particle thing. 
the whole idea where this guy that I'm going to interview Tuesday night, where he says, they said, okay, be prepared for this one second, and boom, in two seconds they're on the other side of, the, outside of the galaxy. That kind of thing where it's a portal technology, it's not a nuts and bolts technology. That's why I think the, con the portal thing, because it goes to the consciousness thing. It says there's more to the world than little nuts and bolts. I guess, I have a question. Yeah. Um, do you think then, I have a question. Yeah. Um, do you think then that this secret space programming, Corey Good and, and all of these people,